hear these, to me, horror stories from friends that have gotten themselves in north of $100,000 in debt from their education. Is it a good idea to turn your passion into a business? Oh, I, I, think, I think if you are starting a business that is not your passion, that's a mistake. Your, your business must be something you're passionate about. Is it uh, distributing documentaries? Is it a, a new streaming service? Is it a type of chocolate? I mean, whatever it is, if you, I don't think a business can succeed unless you're passionate about what it is. And I think it's important to have that mission statement in your head. I mean, I'm constantly altering it for film threat, but yeah, I, I don't know how you could even be successful in a business that you're not passionate about. But I also think it's important to be sober-minded. Um, if you were passionate about crochet toilet paper holders and there's not a market for that, it might fail. I'm talking about hand crocheted toilet paper holders that may be the greatest business idea ever. I'm gonna guess it isn't. But um, I, I just, I, you know, whatever it is that you're passionate about, I think, I, I, I just don't see how you could succeed from a business standpoint because there's so much sacrifice involved in business. It is, um, you know, and for my friends that have very traditional jobs, I have friends that have nine to five jobs, they don't understand that I'm never not working. You know, if it's 9 p.m. on a Saturday night and my website goes down, I have to be available to be able to solve that problem, right? Um, so, um, and I have to be passionate enough about it that it's not an interruption. It's something that I'm leaping to, to take care of it, right? Um, but I do think it's also about a balance. There is freedom in having your own business because I can decide, well, this morning I'm, you know, it's 11 in the afternoon, I'm gonna go see a movie and I can do that. Um, it's also part of my job sometimes. But yeah, I really feel like if you don't have that passion, then don't do that as, as a job, really. Because once you do it, it doesn't even feel like work. I mean, my job doesn't, I never even describe it as work, you know? It's just, it's my purpose for being here. When that teacher said to you, don't you want the nine to five job? Was, I'm sorry, that was high school? That was high school, yeah. Okay, and did they send a note home to say, you know, dear Mrs. Gore, uh, by the way, your son? No. Oh. No, I didn't. We're worried I didn't, about him. Or? I didn't get pushback from that, but okay. I do feel I feel betrayed by my high school education from this standpoint. I it was very much focused on just making good workers for certain types of jobs, and I don't know if traditional pathways for education are preparing um, pre preparing young people for for the types of jobs that are out there. Um, I feel in a way it might, it might be easier to just start your own job. I mean, my, my pathway, which is very non-traditional, and I'm not recommending this, I'm just telling you as an example, here's what I did. I, I felt a, somewhat betrayed by my high school education in the sense that I took, I was like, a, a, got very good grades in school. A's and B's, 3.5, 3.6 plus GPA average. It's, um, uh, I did well. Um, but I sort of stepped outside my comfort zone and said, I, I wanna be a writer, I better learn to type. So I took a typing class and I did not get a good grade in typing, I got a C. And I got a C because I didn't type fast enough. And I thought the criteria was, wait a sec, I care about accuracy, you know? So, I mean, now I type fairly fast, but you know, um, at the time I thought, well, why am I being knocked down? Like I'm actually, that's like outside of the required curriculum. I also took a home ec class because I wanna to learn to cook. Right, and I will say this, um, just in the days where I was single and I cooked, it was as if I did a magic trick. I do think that developing skills that are useful in life are really important and I meet too many of my friends who don't have skills and I feel like a lot of the skills that I developed in high school and beyond were skills that were either things that I chose to do and maybe didn't succeed as well, or they were recreational. For example, when I was in college, I read a book on marketing called Marketing Warfare that taught me almost everything I needed to know about marketing. Brilliant. Um, it, it basically, this book, um, Marketing Warfare, which is an updated version, um, taught me about the rivalries between Coke and Pepsi, McDonald's and Burger King, um, the concept of free 
and how that is used in marketing. And that taught me a lot. Also, I read that book for fun. I was not assigned to that book, I just read it. I also read a book on advertising uh, by George Ogilvy called Ogilvy on Advertising. That was also a recreational read. I learned about fonts. I learned that um, white type against a black background looks 10% larger, among other sort of useless pieces of information that are kind of ingrained in my head about why things work, the differences between non-serif and serif fonts, graphic design. So I tended to expand my horizons by just recreationally reading books that had nothing to do with my chosen pathway, which was filmmaking. Additionally, in terms of my education, I grew up pretty poor. Um, single mother, raised us, and I really wanted to go to USC film school. I really wanted to go to USC. Why George Lucas went there? And George Lucas was my hero because he made Star Wars. And I wanted to go to the same school that George Lucas went. Well, my family being poor, it wasn't even an option for me. And I mean, I was disheartened. I was going to this commuter college, Wayne State University in Detroit, and I was taking their film courses and recreationally reading books about marketing and fonts. And was, I know it sounds strange, but I, I really wanted to glean all that knowledge. And, and when I was, I was just so disheartened. And I remember going on this kind of life-changing trip to the West Coast. My uh, mother took my sister and I to go visit my uncle who lived in the San Diego area. And I begged her, I said, look, I know we're gonna go to like Disneyland and do the, the touristy stuff. Can you just take me to the campus of, of, of USC? Just please take me to the campus. And we just drove on to campus and I went to their bookstore and I took all the money that I had brought for this trip and I bought a copy of every book that I could afford from the film program. Literally a stack of books this big going into my suitcase. Bought every single book and the books that I couldn't afford to buy, I didn't have enough money for, I just wrote down the name of the book and the author. And I went back to, and I read all those books. And I said, if I can't afford this education, and if I cannot afford to go to this school, I'm gonna read all the same books as, the, as the, the, the rich kids that are going to this school. I'm just gonna read all the same books. So I'll have that knowledge. I took, I, I, I took that list of books and those books that I had purchased, and I typed up a list and I passed it out to my film class. And I said, hey, check it out. We're, we were reading some of those books, but not all of them, I said. This is what the students at USC are, are reading. I, I feel like, like I'm just gonna read all these books and that's what I did. Oddly enough, I dropped out of school. It was really a conflict between, I remember at the time my parents um, debating over who should pay for my education. I was getting some financial aid, but I was working three jo jobs. I still had paper routes when I was in college. So I worked at a video store, restaurants on the weekends, and I had newspaper routes, and getting financial aid, and just trying to do my best to get through college. And it was, uh, it was a lot. So um, I finally just said, I can't, I can't continue doing this, you know? And I, that's when I decided I would just do this thing called film threat. Because I could, it would give me an excuse to talk to filmmakers um, because they'd have to talk to me because I was doing this zine, right? And I, I ended up, you know, months after the first issues of Film Thread came out, I dropped out of college. Years later, ironically, I wrote a book called The Ultimate Film Festival Survival Guide, which is now for a lot of film programs in their in part of their independent film studies, my book is required reading. So I have done speaking engagements at certain colleges. So I just find it funny that here I am, like I dropped out of college, dropped out of film school, um, never completed my formal education, and now I talk to students who have read my book, which is filled with a lot of um, no BS advice um, about how to launch your, your career in independent film. When you saw the list of books for USC at that time when you had visited uh, LA, did you almost feel like you were being let in on a secret? In some way. Wow. When I when I when I looked at the types of books that that were part of that program, it, it was kind of like getting a glimpse into like this secret world because there was a better balance of there were some film theory, you know, and and you know, critical essay types of books that got into a philosophy of film 
and cinema. But then there were more production books, cinematography, right? Production, sound, like much more of the, uh, much more about the craft of filmmaking. So I felt that their choices of books had a much better balance. Um, but I was pleased to see some of the some of the the philosophical books mixed in there as well. Um, I really think it's like what you're what you're attracted to. I love the philosophy. I also think it, at the end of the day, you know, um, you got you got to know you got to know how everything functions and works together. You have to know about editing, not just the theory of editing, but how to physically do it. So I so I, I think that and a lot of trade schools have cropped up where you can pay. You can pay a sum of money and just get an education in trade, but I feel like you're never not done with your education. I, I mean, myself even, like, I'm always learning something. I'm always listening to, you know, uh, filmmaker commentary and podcasts and 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 whatnot. I, I'm always I'm always learning. It's like that that thirst for knowledge has never has never left me. Would you recommend to? Well, maybe this is too personal, but but having gone a route that wasn't as traditional. No, no, no you can go too personal. Okay, I mean, as someone who also dropped out of school, mm -hmm. I, I, and and it was mostly because of financial yeah. uh, reasons. If I were to have children now, I don't know what I would advise them. But I don't have kids, so I don't have to worry about that. But just as a parent, what yeah. would you tell? Uh, yeah, I you know um, I really think it's it's. It comes down to a personal choice. I feel like there is a generation that may have not been given enough useful um, uh, education that that would apply to what what the marketplace is looking for. That's why I think you see the rise of so many independent creators, whether it be on YouTube, filmmakers, and whatnot. Um, there's so much more opportunity for independent creators. But I do think it's important to have that base knowledge, you know? So I don't know, I, 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 God, it's a, it's a tough one. One thing I do know is I never advise friends of mine who are making films to ever go in debt. I mean, I know, I know the math. I know that if you borrow $30,000 on a credit card and only pay the minimum, it'll take you over a decade to pay it off and you'll pay almost $100,000. Don't do that. And so student loans, not recommended. If there is any way to get around getting yourself in any sort of debt, go that way. So do I recommend or not recommend a formal education? I feel like that's your personal choice. What I will say is don't go into debt. If there's any way to avoid debt or manage it, or at least know that if you're going to go into a reasonable amount of debt, that you're able to afford it. You know, it's, it's, it's something that is viable, not something you get in North. I hear these, to me, horror stories from friends that have gotten themselves in North of $100,000 in debt from their education. And I think this is crazy. You, you know, you'll never build up any sort of financial security. So um, that I would recommend avoid debt, but choose your own pathway, whether it's a non-traditional one or a traditional in terms of your education and never ever stop learning, meaning you always got a book that you're reading or a commentary that you're listening to. I always, this is why I don't mind LA traffic, which I know we all sit in a lot. If you live in LA, you're gonna be in traffic. I've <laughs> got a book ready to go. I'm not, I don't really, cause I spend too much time in front of a screen most days that I don't tend to read a book, but I'm very well listened. So I will listen to a lot of books and I tend to go between, I love biographies, um, you know, autobiographies uh, written by the author. I and I tend to go from nonfiction to fiction. I just ping pong between the two, um, and uh, yeah, I'm a big, big Audible okay. fan. So, um, but yeah, like that education should never be ending. You should always be curious and always be challenging yourself. And if you're not thinking, if you're not thinking and questioning, it's like, well, that's then you're just, you know, no one's ever done. I mean, like devices that we have, they're not done. That's why that's where firmware update, updates come from, right? So I consider my continuing education to be firmware updates to my brain. I know that's a weird way of putting it. Someone out there who's watching or listening to this is gonna understand it, but um, I feel my continuing education is just a series of firmware updates.